But I didn't say this. If you don't have a Bible, go ahead and get one. Get your hand up. Get your hands up if you don't have a Bible. You want to follow along in the text as we're going to go through uh, the first section of chapter one of Romans. So if you don't have a Bible, go ahead and get your hand up. They're right over here, and we can get one in your hand so you go along with us. This is the book of Romans, and it's probably you know one of the most important books in the entire Bible, if not just the New Testament. And Lord willing, we should be able to get through the book of Romans in about 400 years or so. <laughs> that, that's, that's the plan, okay? That's, that's what we're planning. But let me ask you a question. Do you have a plan? Do you have a plan? Do you know where you stand? Eternally speaking, that is. Do you know where you stand? Every religion, every faith has an eternal place, a holy habitation, a spiritual location, an eternal destination. Every religion or faith has its own version of heaven, paradise, nirvana, or Shangri-La. But the question is, is how, how do we get there? How do you get there? What do you do to obtain? Some say it takes great strain to achieve but that, my friend, is the act. And if you look closer, you'll discover doctrine. Doctrine. It's a word we don't like. It's a, it's a word that scares people. Doctrine. But it simply means teaching. Teaching. Truth. And if you take your time and you ask a priest or a pastor, if you ask a rabbi or an imam, if you ask the sage, or the guru, you will learn as you discover doctrine that they all have different paths, different rituals. Some have hoops and hurdles you have to haul, go over and through. Some have obligations and offerings. Some have principles and practices, rules and regulations. And when you discover and study doctrine, the difference becomes clearer and hopefully they steer you in the right direction. So as the true and living God gave us away the truth and the life. And he said no one can come to, this, to, the, to the true and living God. No one can come to God except through the Son. Amen. Now that might seem narrow to some. But it, you know it's really loving. It's really loving. Because see your creator, your heavenly father doesn't want you to get lost along the way. So he's given you a map and a plan right here that you won't get lost, that you'll find the way, that you'll know the truth, and you'll discover life. It's a loving Father that gives us this map. And the only path that leads to salvation. I'm a Christian. I confess before you. I'm a pastor, and I make no bones about it. And see, the thing about it is the, the Christian path of eternal salvation is clear. It's crystal clear. It's not ambiguous. It's the Romans road. It's Romans chapter 3, verse 23, which says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated His own love toward us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why did He do this? It's Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And how do we make this gift ours? How do, how do we appropriate it to us? It's Romans 10, 9. And it says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. See, you, you can't earn it, or you can't do anything for it. You can, by simple faith, receive this wonderful gift of God. But to the Muslim, it's not that clear. See, to the Muslim, you can keep the five pillars of the faith. You can live a righteous life. You can be a good man, but you have no guarantee of heaven. Well, there's one guarantee. If you become a martyr and you kill someone that doesn't believe what you believe, then you have a guarantee. But that's different from what we believe. Secondly, the Bible tells us that it's appointed for man to die once. But after this, the judgment. 
And the statistics for death, they're, they're pretty clear. You know, 10 out of 10 people are going to die. It, it's pretty clear. And, but the Hindu, they, they believe that you keep coming back. It's called reincarnation. That if you live a life that's not up, and, up to par, you will, you know, bad karma. You have, any, anybody here living in bad karma? Anybody? Yeah. If you have bad karma, well, then you're going to come back in a lesser state. So if you are considered middle class, you're going to come back in poverty. If you're poverty, you're going to come back as a snail. But as a snail, if you live a righteous life, you're going to come back in poverty. And if you live a righteous life in poverty, you'll come back middle class. You go through stations. That's what they understand. That's what they believe. But never do they ever get to heaven as we understand it. Never. No other religion gives a person a plan of certainty. That Christianity or a personal relationship with Jesus Christ gives you. And if you're obedient to this book and this plan, I love this book. I love what God has given us. If you're obedient to His plan and you fulfill His plan for salvation, then God gives you a purpose. A purpose. A purpose for life. And it's called doctrine. It's called teaching. And it's our fourth P word. As you fulfill God's purpose for your life, then God gives you provision. Provision to fulfill this purpose for your life. As all other religions teach, you must do. And do and do and do. And do and do and do. And do. But... Christianity teaches, done, just believe. And it's a guarantee. See, it says, done, done, done by Jesus Christ on the cross. You just receive. And, and, and you know, you know that you know that you know that you know that you have eternal life because of what He's done, not what you do. And in its Romans, chapter 1, verse 1, look at it with me. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. See, Paul begins this letter to the church in Rome, as he did all letters, with a greeting. What makes this a little bit different is this is the longest greeting from all his other writings. It's long, and Paul is, can be long-winded. That's why I like him. We're related. But Paul identifies himself as the instrument, very, very simply as the instrument by which the Holy Spirit uses to write this letter. And he just simply says, Paul. Paul. And then he gives his qualifications to be used by the Holy Spirit for this letter when he says, a bondservant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name, among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ. Now, most people believe that Paul wrote this letter from the city of Corinth on his third missionary journey. There are some people that will debate and say, no, it was his second missionary journey, but I believe that it's the third, and most scholars date this at approximately 56 to 58 A.D. Now, Paul, at this point, is set. He, he misses Israel. He misses Jerusalem, and the Passover is coming. So it's his heart to get back to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover with his brethren. He misses fellowship. And so he's going to set out to get back, but he's going to be hindered. And by the time he gets to Jerusalem, the Passover's passed. We're in the time of the Pentecost, and, and there's Paul, and, and he presents himself before James and the others, having taken a vow of a Nazarite, and they say, Paul, we're hearing all this crazy stuff, and we think it would be good that if you would, you know, basically sponsor these other guys that have a vow of a Nazarite and go to the temple and fulfill this vow. So he does. And when he gets there, the Judaizers 
basically they say Paul is trying to sneak a Gentile into the temple courts. Falsely accused. A riot breaks out. The garrison sees what's going on. They come down and literally pluck Paul out because the, the Jews, they wanted to tear him from limb to limb. I mean, literally, just rip him in pieces. They pluck him, they put him on the stairwell to take him up to the, to the jail. And Paul says, speaking to them in Greece, hey, let me speak to my brethren. And they say, okay. And he speaks to them and he preaches the gospel. And the place explodes. Explodes. Okay, well, then the captain knows, hey, we got to get this guy out of here or we're going to have a riot on our hands. So they take him up to the jail, they beat him up, and he says, um, falsely accused, why do you beat a fellow Roman citizen? And they go, whoa! Because the penalty for a Roman citizen being beaten is death. And so they're just freaked out. And this begins Paul's journey, a long two, three-year journey to Rome. Not the way Paul wanted to go, but the way the Holy Spirit intended him to go. Paul always wanted to go to Rome. He desired to visit on his way to Spain because he wanted to go to Spain to preach the gospel, but the Lord had a different path in mind. Isn't that how kind of life works? We have our own plans. You know, just like, what's your plan? We have our own plans. We'd, we'd kind of like to do this or kind of like to do that, but sometimes God has a different idea. And, 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 you know, by the time you're like in the middle of it, you're thinking, wow, how did this happen? And you're thinking, this is crazy. Everybody's against me. I, I, Lord, where are you? And then he gets you through it and you think, well, praise the Lord. Look what God has done. Look at the great things he's done. It wasn't the way we intended but just like Paul, he didn't intend it, but here he is. Now, the name Paul means small, little, or humble, whereas his Hebrew name Saul means asked for or prayed for. It also means strength, demand, or destroyer. He's a destroyer. And remember, Paul, before he was Paul, was Saul, the destroyer of the Christian faith. He was the chief persecutor of the church. And now he's the principal author of the New Testament. And this was due to his conversion, as God humbled him on the road to Damascus, making him a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Now the word bondservant literally is doulos in the Greek, and it's better translated as slave. He's a bond slave. But people don't like to use slave because, you know, people don't like to talk about slaves this day and age. It's like, oh, we don't want to offend anybody. But he was literally a, a slave. He chose to be a slave of Jesus Christ. The idea is he's a willing person. Because of everything God did for him, he now willingly serves God in this capacity. And what is he a slave to? He says he's a slave to the gospel of God. He's not a slave to anything else. He's a slave to the gospel of God. And, and, and Paul communicates this, that I, I'm doing this freely and willingly. You know, it's funny, Jesus said in John 8, 34, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And, and the idea was one that Paul knew very well. Whatever you're into, you're a slave to that. Whatever your master passion is, you're a slave to that. If you're into cleaning, I mean, <laughs> come over to my house. No, but I mean, it could be cars, it could be work, it could be whatever. It, money, money, you're so into money, i got to get money, money, where's money? i got money, 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 no, you know, you, you, you're, you're a slave to whatever your master passion is. And so here Paul is saying, listen, at one point, I was a slave to the law of Moses. I was a slave to the law. I was a slave. 613 Mosaic laws. I had them. Um, Memorized frontwards, backwards, sidewards. I was a slave to the law. But the problem with the law, if that's your master passion, it only leads to a hierarchy of hypocrisy. It only leads to religiosity. I don't even know if those are words, but they sound good. But when Saul became Paul, God blinded him. He blinded him for the purpose of being able to see truth. 
And, and, and when those scales fell off of his eyes, he was a slave to the gospel of God. Paul knew the law could only be a schoolmaster that reveals and condemns a person of their sin. But the gospel of God, the good news, the good news of God was good news because it's God saves mankind from the condemnation of the law into a personal relationship with himself. That's not good news. That's great news, folks. See, next Paul tells the Romans of his calling as an apostle. And the word apostle simply means sent one by God with authority. If you're a born-again believer, and only you know in your heart, if you're a born-again believer, you are sent by God and he's given you authority. You have authority to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have authority to be witnesses of Jesus Christ no matter where you are. You have authority. God has given you great authority. But the problem is, is we don't think we have any authority. Who am I? You're a born-again believer, filled with the Holy Spirit, full of authority. God saves mankind. The Bible tells us as believers, we're to make our calling and election sure. In the eyes of the Lord, we're all called to be servants. We're all called to be slaves. But like Paul, not to any man, but to the gospel of God, to the truth of salvation. See, the word gospel means good news. That's what it means. It means good news. You know, it's like if, if you got home and, and you found somebody with balloons and the publisher's clearing house, you'd say, hey, great news. But the thing is, is you're going to spend the money, it's going to be gone. The thing is, is God's good news you can't exhaust. It's eternal. It's good news. It's great news. And the purpose isn't just for salvation. See, it's not just for salvation. See, it's for God's purpose in your life. See, look at what Paul says in, in verse 2, because there's nothing new about the good news when he says, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. See, the good news was overlooked by all the religious leaders. Gamaliel, doesn't matter who they were, they overlooked it. They, they, weren't, they weren't looking for a crucified Savior. They were looking for a conquering king. And so they overlooked it. They overlooked everything the holy prophets foretold about the suffering Savior, which was promised to mankind way back in Genesis chapter 3, way back in the beginning. Before God ever created anything you see, God promised mankind a Savior. There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament concerning Messiah that were fulfilled by Jesus. The probabilities of fulfilling 48 of them is 1 in 1 to the 157th power. That's 157 zeros. One person out of all that. Probability tells you it's 100% Jesus is Messiah. But look what he says in verse 3, concerning his son. It just not concern, it's not concerning Jim or David. It's not concerning Joe or, or, or Steve. It does, it's, it's concerning Jesus the Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. By the resurrection of the dead, through him we have received grace and apostleship so we can have a good life. No, that's not what it says. It says, for the obedience to the faith among all the nation for his name, among whom also you are called Jesus of Jesus Christ. You're called of Christ. You're called by him, for him. And, and, and the grace that we get, the gospel that was sent, isn't so we can just like go out and live a life like we want to do anything we want to do. It's not what he's saying here. You know, it's not like, okay, let's all, you know, we're done, let's go to the bar. Church is over. No, it's for the obedience to the faith. It's for the obedience to the faith. That's why that grace is given to you, for the obedience to the faith. See, it wasn't David or Bob or Bill or John that hung on that cross. It was Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, who is the Christ, who is the Lord, who is the Savior. And in John chapter 8, again, speaking to the religious leaders, Jesus said in verse 21, He says, 
I'm going away, and you will seek me, and will die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. And so the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And Jesus said to them, you are from beneath, and I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said that you will die in your sins, for, you, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I am is the tetragram, Yahweh. If you do not believe I am Yahweh, if you do not believe I am God in the flesh, if you don't believe these things, you'll die in your sins. Only Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecies in his incarnation. Only Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies concerning the brutality of his beatings and his death. Only Jesus died for mankind on the cross. Only Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies concerning the resurrection from the dead. From Jesus' birth until his death, that at every point in between, only Jesus fulfilled the promises of the Jewish Messiah who is the Savior of the world. And so Paul says in verse 5, Through Him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for His name, among whom you are also the called of Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ. Now a lot of people would say, well, see, I'm not an apostle, but that's why he tags us. He says, among whom you also, all you believers, are also called. You're also called. The apostle declares that through Jesus Christ we have received God's grace. God's grace is God's unmerited favor. Paul says that he was called as an apostle. But God's grace isn't given to anyone except for the obedience to the faith. As a witness to all the people everywhere. See, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're young or old, retired, working, whether you're at the grocery store or the gas station. Wherever you go, you're called to be a witness of Jesus Christ. You're called to tell people about the love of God. You're called to tell people about the free gift of salvation. You are called of God if you're in Christ Jesus to the gospel of God. Each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. See, the church in Rome, it wasn't founded by Paul. It wasn't founded by James. It wasn't founded by John or Peter or anyone. The, the church in Rome was a result of the moving of the Holy Spirit, working spontaneously through believers, and out of it came this incredible church. Well, how did that happen? Well, you got to, back in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, Peter standing there preaching. The Bible says that there were the, some from Rome who heard the good news. They heard it, and they received it with gladness, and they took it back, and they started proclaiming the good news to everyone they came in contact with. And out of this, the Holy Spirit's just moving, going crazy, and people are getting saved, and the church is growing. And, and, and what God is doing, Paul hears, and he says, I want to be a part of that. See, Paul didn't have anything to do with the foundation of the church, but he had everything to do with the relationship of this church. See, he had relationships with many people, many believers. Remember, Paul had been on three missionary journeys, logged thousands of miles, met a lot of people, and some of those people God transplanted from, from Galatia to Rome, or Ephesus to Rome. Anyone here ever moved in their life? Anyone? Wow, first, everybody raised their hand first service. See, if, if you've moved, then you've been transplanted from one place to another place. And so Paul had many friends, many associates in Rome, and when he concludes this letter, and we'll get there in about a thousand years, chapter 16, he will greet by name 26 individuals that he knew and had a relationship with. He had a personal relationship, 26 people, he names by name, that are there. And he's hearing about all that God's doing. So beginning in verse 7, he greets these believers and he describes them to us when he says, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now first, notice Paul didn't say, hey, to you guys in the church of Rome. He doesn't do that. He says, hey, to all who are in Rome, to all you believers, 
that are in Mesa today, I greet you. See, And then he describes them as the beloved of God. Literally, this should be God's loved ones. God's loved ones. Have you ever doubted God's love for you? Have you ever doubted that God loves you? A lot of people do. Stop it, please. You're God's loved one. He loves you. And many people of the faith, they really struggle with this. See, they, they struggle because they feel like, you know, just like in, in, a, in a personal relationship with another human being, you have to, you know, earn favor. If I send my wife flowers, she will make me my favorite meal. Or not. But see, there's this, this thing, this relationship thing, and, and the more that you do for someone, you expect back. But see, here... You can't do anything. God just loves you. Amen. You're His beloved. You're His loved one. We can say God loves me. You can say God loves me. God loves me. You can say it a thousand times. But my question is, is do you really know it? Do you really know it? That in spite of every stupid thing you do, and we do stupid things, God still loves you. That, that nothing you can do adds to God's love for you. Nothing you do subtracts God's love for you. God's not sitting there going, oh, I can't believe David did it. I, you know what? I'm taking a little love away. <laughs> he loves you. He loves you. And, and you have to understand that because this will revolutionize your relationship with God. God loves you in Christ Jesus. He doesn't love you in Buddha. He doesn't lo love you in Muhammad. He loves you in Christ Jesus. God loves you and wants to hang out with you. Have you ever realized that God just wants to hang out with you? He wants to spend time with you? In most cases, you know, He really, really, really desires to spend more time with you. The problem is, is we don't allow Him to. Well, God, I can give you five minutes here and maybe 12 minutes there and, you know, <laughs> you know maybe in the car. He wants to hang out with you and spend time with you and speak to you. And one of the things that we don't understand is, you know, what it means to God's heart to make Jesus as your Savior. The joy that he feels. The, the love, you know, oh, David, David receives Jesus as my... We don't even comprehend what it means to God's heart when you turn off the TV when you turn off your cell phone, put it in your pocket, you, you turn off all the distractions, and you say, Lord, I love you, and I'm making you a priority. What that means to his heart. Then Paul describes the believers here in Rome, he says they're called to be saints. And that simply means being dedicated or consecrated to God. When, when most people think of saints, the first thing they think of is, is basically those people that are canonized by the Catholic Church. There's over 5,000 saints. You can actually get a book and it lists all the, the saints, you know, the, the saint over the dishwasher and the, you know, there's a saint for everything. But here Paul is saying, in Christ Jesus, you are a saint. You're a saint. You are dedicated and consecrated to God in Christ Jesus. This is foreign to a lot of people. They don't understand how important and how precious they are to God. Now, what this does mean that, you know, if you want to go, go home and on your way home, you go by the, the Christian bookstore or something, and you can get a badge that says, you know, St. Jim, St. George. You can, you can get that, but what you don't want to do, and please don't do this, don't make a little statue of yourself to put it on the dash. <laughs> it's not going to protect you from any kind of accidents. In fact, you'll get more accidents because you'll be looking at it going, wow, that's a really good likeness of me. Bam! <laughs> You're a saint. You're a saint. The bottom line is every person in the bottom of, of bottom, body of Christ is a saint, and Paul is writing to all of us. All of us, every one of us. And he didn't say the saints except for, you know, those 30 questionable people. I'm getting some names right now. He's saying to all who believe in Rome, saints. And then Paul says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In all of Paul's 13 letters, 
there is a reference to what is known as the Siamese twins of the New Testament, grace and peace. Now, I believe in Timothy, he throws in a mercy, you know, in between. And that's okay. It's a nice Oreo cookie. Um, but what he's being, and, 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 this, and this is beyond Paul's intellect and his brilliance. This is the brilliance of the, of the Holy Spirit. Because what you have to understand here is what he's doing is he's taking a common Greek greeting. Grace. You know, if you were, if you were Greek or Roman, you would see another Roman, and you'd see Greece, and they'd say, grace, 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 grace. And you have people walking around saying grace, and, and what that meant, and, 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 you gotta, and this is so awesome, is may this day be better than you desire. That's what it meant. So you'd be saying to somebody, hey, Jim, may this day be better than you desire. Grace, grace. And then he takes the, the common Hebrew greeting, Peace, shalom, shalom. And a lot of people, they, they characterize just shalom as peace. But to a Hebrew person, when you said shalom, what you were doing is you were saying, may God's best characterize your life. So he's saying, hey, may this day be better than you desire and may God's best characterize your life. And it's very simple, but it's very profound in the sense that you can never know God's best until you know God's grace. You, you can never know God's best for your life until you're walking in His grace, God's unmerited favor. See, once you're walking in God's grace, then you'll be at peace. Your life will be characterized by God's best because you're at peace. You'll be content. See, peace gives you contentment. Yeah, in spite of all these things, I trust God. I'm at peace in the situation. Godliness with peace is great gain. It's great gain. Never in the Bible are these two ever switched. Never are they reversed because a person cannot know God's peace until our relationship with God is no longer based on works, but based on grace, unmerited favor. I can't earn it. If I try to earn it, I'm never going to be at peace. I'm never going to be at peace. And the response of knowing and walking in God's grace is a greater obedience to God. See, that, that feeling, I don't have to earn it. I don't have to earn God's love. I can't change God's love. He loves me so much. He died for me. I can't earn my salvation. See, if you always feel like you have to earn somebody's love, if you always have to feel like you have to earn salvation, it's always going to lead to rebellion. It's always, no matter what you do, when you have to earn something, it's rebellion. It's like at your work. Work, 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 work. Well, you start taking shortcuts, rebellion. But when you walk in grace, you just want to please your father. See, there's an internet story, and it really spoke to my heart. It's about teenagers as young as 12 years old. And they're losing their virginity in incredible numbers. And what they're doing is they're sneaking into their parents' home, 1 a.m., 3 a.m., and, and, and the girls that were less apt to having premarital sex were the girls that have a loving relationship with their mothers where they knew their mother loved them in spite of doing anything stupid, where they didn't worry about getting beat up, where they didn't worry about punishment, where they didn't worry about having to earn that love, but they understood their mother loved them unconditionally. And, and so... Because of that, these girls were less apt to have premarital sex because they didn't want to hurt or disappoint their mothers. But if they did, they knew their mothers still loved them and they would put their arms around them and not beat them up. Now, we too were not obedient to earn God's love or to earn God's favor. Your obedience won't do that. You can't earn salvation. We're obedient because of God's love. Because of God's love, because of God's favor, because of everything He's done for this, personally, because of this great gift that's been given to me, I want my life to be pleasing to Him. I want it to mean something to Him. And so my obedience is because He loves me. And when I blow it, He still loves me. Because I can't add to and take away from God's love towards me, I want to please Him. And I want my life to mean something to him. I don't want a wasted life. I don't want a wasted life. I don't want to waste my response to God's grace. 
his unmerited favor, because that produces a changed life, a quality of life, a holy life. And that's what separates Christianity from all the other religions in the world. Everyone else is trying to earn God's love. Everyone else is trying to earn acceptance with God. I don't have to earn anything. I just have to open my heart and say, thank you, God. Thank you. I receive all that you have for me. Thank you. I don't have to do anything for it. I just receive it. But no other, every other religion says, no, you have to. Instead of saying, no, Jesus did. He says in verse 8, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Remember, Paul logged thousands of miles spreading the gospel. He's all throughout the entire Roman Empire spreading the gospel. And what does he keep hearing? What keeps coming up? The faith of the church that's in Rome. The, what, the wonderful work that God's doing. He says right here, he says that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Everywhere he went, they were talking about the church in Rome. Wow, this is a loving church. This is a faithful church. God's doing great things in this church. And then you, you, you look at that and you remember, where is he writing from? He's writing from Corinth. Corinth, one of the most immoral. Now, I say it's immoral, but Rome isn't that much better. You know what I mean? They're both in moral cities. But what's the difference is the letters that Paul writes to Corinth, it's riddled with nothing but problems. This is the church. The Corinth church is riddled with nothing but problems and maturity and morality. But the church in Rome, all he hears about is their faith. What God is doing. It's preceded them in the world. And, you know, and I, I, I think, hey, you know, what precedes me? What precedes you? When people get together and talk, and they talk about you, they bring your name up, what are you known for? What are you known for? You know, at, at work, you know, what, do you, what are you known for? What, what is the church you go to known for? Is it your faith or your complaints? W when you come up in conversation, are people talking about your faith, your love, your generosity, the integrity of your character, or, or is it the other stuff that, Paul talked about in the church in Corinth, where you think, yikes! And it's important. It's imper it really is important. And he says in verse 9, For my God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests if, by some means now, at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Because of what God is doing in this church, Paul, Paul says, I want to go. I want to be there with you guys. I want to fellowship with you guys. I you know, where the Spirit of God is, that's where you want to be. You know what I mean? Where the love of God is, that's where you want to be. If the love of God isn't somewhere, don't be there. If the Spirit of God isn't moving there, don't be there. Go find where it is moving. And Paul's saying, the Spirit of God's moving there. I want to go there. And though, even though Paul wants to visit them in the flesh, the, I, I love this about Paul because he's, he's, a, he's a part of this fellowship. He's a part of this fellowship. And he's a part of it through his prayers. Through his prayers. And he says, as God is my witness, I'm praying for you without ceasing. In all of my prayers. You know, I, I'm reading this and I immediately think about all the times, you know, Someone will come up to you and you go, hey, can I pray for you? And you say, yeah, can you pray for this? And then they walk away and you know they never prayed for you. You know? Have you ever done that? Have you ever said to somebody, hey, you know, what's, what's the matter? Can I pray for you? Yeah, yeah, you know. And then you walk away. Don't do that. Stop right there. Just stop right there. Listen, you can be five minutes later to the restaurant. It's okay. Stop right there. Put your hands on them. Take out your oil. If you don't have oil, put in a request for oil. We'll put oil in your hands. The stuff we, we like to give away is frankincense and myrrh, so everybody you anoint will smell like sugar cookies. And you just stop right there. You open it up. You anoint them, and you pray for them. And then you could say, as God is my witness, I pray. I'm praying. I'm not just not lip service Christianity. I'm praying for you. I've prayed for you. Verse 11, For I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift so that you may be established. He not only wants to fellowship with them, but he wants to bless them using the giftings that God has given him. He says, hey, I want to come here and I want to hang out with you and fellowship with you and I want to bless you with the gifts. 
I'm going to bless you with my gifts. You know, we have, I'd say, close to 150 people here. And all of you got gifts. There's not one of you here that does not have gifts. And God wants you to impart them in the people next to you. To establish them, to encourage them, to exhort them. Exhort them. Use your gifts. Bless people with your gifts. And Paul here, he's saying, listen, I want to do this. I want to bless you and use my gift. You know, he, he considers himself with like-minded believers. They, they thought alike. And he says in verse 12, that is that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. You see that like-mindedness? Hey, we have mutual faith. We believe the same things. We believe in the moving of the Spirit. Paul realizes that these believers, he not only can bless, but they can be a blessing to, to him. There's somebody next to you that you may not believe it. They can bless your life. You, you can turn to them and say, hey, can you pray for me? And they can speak into your life. You don't need a pastor to do that. You need the person next to you to just lay hands on you and to bless you with their gift. And Paul's saying, hey, I want to bless you, but I know you're going to bless me. You're going to bless me. I need encouragement. I need to be exhorted. And Paul, Paul realizes, Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance or the face of his friends. Amen. He cares. He cares. In verse 13, now I do not want to be unaware, brethren, that I often plan to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you as also, just as among the other Gentiles. One of Paul's gifting was to, he was an evangelist. He really was. And so what he's saying here is, you know, I've been to all these other Gentile cities preaching the gospel, and people are coming to faith, but I want to come there, and I want to be used of God in Rome, to preach the gospel. Yeah, it's not going to end up the way he wanted it to. And he's saying, I've been hindered up until now, you know, things. But God's will is that I'm going to go to Rome. Now, when he goes to Rome, he's going to go to Rome in chains. In, in chains. And, and you know what's going what's to precede when people talk about Paul in Rome? They're going to say, all of the guards in Ro and Nero's palace are saved. Everyone that was chained to Paul got saved. Everyone that came in contact with Paul got saved. <laughs> what a glorious thing. He, he's going to get fruit. He's going to bear fruit in Rome. And then he says in verse 14, For I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. Now, it's interesting. A lot of people go barbarians. If you were a non-speaking Greek, if you didn't speak Greek, what language you spoke was considered what they call barbar. Barbar. Barbar? Barbar. Now, I'm not up here, you know, this isn't me speaking in tongues, but what, what it was to the Greek who heard any other language, they said it sounded like this. Seriously, this, if you ask them what's barbar, they would say, that's what they heard if it wasn't Greek. And so Paul's saying both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. See, he considered himself to the entire Gentile world. He's called as an apostle to the entire Gentile world. And he takes his calling so seriously, he felt that he was a debtor to the unsaved Gentiles. He had a debt to pay to them. This isn't legalism. This, this isn't, you have to understand, this isn't legalism. What this is, is Paul's way to maintain focus on what was important in life. See, Paul is just like we, and we can very easily be pulled in many different directions. So for him to maintain his focus on what was important, the gospel and preaching the gospel to the, to the Gentiles, he said, I'm a debtor to all of these people. I'm a debtor that can only be paid either by their salvation or by my death. I think that when you have that kind of attitude towards the gospel of God, God's going to do great things through your life. Absolutely. If you look at everybody that's important in your life and you say, I'm a debtor to them, that they hear the gospel, God's going to do great things. And so he goes on in verse 15. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Paul was ready in season and out of season. 
If you were breathing, Paul was preaching. He was preaching to you. It didn't matter. And then Paul tells us in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the gospel that is, is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. This is the theme of the book of Romans, right here. If you're a note taker, you can write in your margin and you can say, this is the main point. This is the thing. This is, this is the root that's going to feed all the branches in the chapters of the book of Romans. This is it. The power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For everyone who believes. See, the letter to the believers in Rome is different of all of Paul's letters. Way different. All of his other writings were, were written to churches to address problems, to address issues and circumstances in those churches. But Paul writes to the Romans to, not to address any problems, to proclaim God's plan of salvation for mankind, to proclaim grace. Grace, the gospel of God, is grace. God's unmerited favor. And so he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now in a sophisticated society like Rome or Greece, they would be embarrassed to worship um, a crucified God. Uh, you want us to worship a dead God? A crucified God? Um, hello? And see, the, it's the attitude of the entire world because the scripture tells us, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Cursed is anyone who is crucified. You want us to, you want us to make a crucified Jew a God? Our God? Um, hello? Hello? How can a God be worth worshiping that's been crucified? That God, he's cursed. He hung on a tree. But the gospel of God centers around a crucified Jewish Savior. And you've got to remember, too, at this point, the Jews are a conquered people under the fist of Rome. They're a conquered people. Wait, uh, uh, no, 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 no. We worship generals and leaders, not uh, conquered people with a crucified Jew as our God. We don't. No, no, no. <laughs> you ever talk to people and they go, dead Savior, come on. How can a dead Savior save anybody? That's what the Roman Empire is saying. How can a dead Savior save anybody? Not even the Jewish elite. See, the Jewish leaders, the, the religious leaders, they were embarrassed to have a Savior that would be crucified. See, they didn't want a crucified Savior. They wanted a conquering king. We need a conquering king. We need someone dynamic. Not a crucified Savior. When Paul was still Saul, he couldn't embrace the thought of a Messiah that would be crucified. Ugh, really? No way! And that's why he set out to destroy those that were of the way. That's what a Christian was called in the days of the beginning of Christianity. They were of the way. They were of the way. But see, that changed on the road to Damascus, didn't it? See, on the road to Damascus, Saul was knocked off his high horse, knocked off his pedestal, blinded by God for the purpose of letting him see the truth. Just like the blind man, I, I don't know anything. All I know is I was once blind and now I see. And, and when those scales fell from Saul's eyes, his outlook and his name was changed. And so he says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel of God. 
See, Paul's not ashamed of the way God has chosen to save sinful man. Paul's not ashamed that God chose to send his son to the cross and, and taking the place of sinful man on that cross to save sinful man. Paul knows the law cannot, could not, will not save a fly. Only simple faith in a crucified Savior can. To the pagan world, a Jew was considered less than. Even today, Jews are considered less than. I don't take offense with that. I know I'm less than. God didn't choose the Jews because we were great. He chose the Jews because we were the least of all peoples, the Scripture says. And to this world, Jews are less than, but God chose to save mankind through a less than man who owned nothing in this world and died with less. Even the clothes on his back, they tore off and they basically auctioned off. They cast lots. Who gets the, who gets the clothes? He had nothing and he died with even less. He was disowned by his own people, rejected, and died the death of a less than man, being crucified. And this man, this God-man, Jesus Christ, is the Savior of the world. And he's the Savior of the world and he never traveled out, never in his ministry did he ever leave Galilee or, or Judea. He was always in this region, you know, in between is Samaria. But that's, as a kid, he went to Egypt, but he was right there. And yet this less than man on that tree is the Savior of all the world. And Paul says that this gospel has power. And the word is dudamus. It's where we get the word dynamite from. And the idea, this word literally translates, is it's power that works wonders. It's power that gives one the ability to carry out something. And let me tell you something. Rome was all about power. Oh, America, all about power. Russia, all about power. Rome, America, the civilized world, were all about power and intimidation. They love their military power. They love their governmental power. They love their roads and their buildings. They love their intellectual power, their philosophical and educational power. But those things cannot save anyone. And Rome had not yet experienced the power of God to save and transform a human life and a civilization. And he does this by breaking the bonds of sin. And he does this through grace, through love. And the church today, the church today has moved away. We've moved away from the power that's only in the gospel of God. And we're preaching a social gospel because we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to say, hey, sinner. We don't want to say that. We don't want to offend anybody. But I'll tell you this, there's a generation of people that aren't being offended right into hell. And every time that God has prepared a heart and they hear this gospel of Jesus the Messiah, they listen and then they receive it with gladness. And the first thing they say to you is, why didn't you tell me this sooner? What, 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 I've known you for how many years? Why didn't you say anything to me? I, I, I guarantee there's when we get to heaven there's going to be people, people that are uh, tap, tap, tap. Hey, you remember me from high school? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me about Jesus? Why didn't you tell me what God did for me? Why did you not say anything? Well, I, I didn't want to offend you. you know. I, I had to hear from some chaplain on my deathbed. I could have lived a, an abundant life in Jesus Christ. And I had to wait 70 years to hear the gospel. Because it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now, it doesn't matter who hears it. It doesn't matter who hears it. If they believe, then they're saved. If they confess with their mouth. They believe in their heart. They are born again. They're saved. They're saved from death and from sin. 
And Paul says to the Jew first, and he doesn't say that because he believes they're better. Oh, no, 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 no. What he's saying is it's to the Jew first because God sent Messiah to the Jewish people who rejected him first. He came to the Jews, they rejected him, and that's why he's a debtor to the Gentiles because after they rejected him, salvation came to the Gentiles to provoke the Jews into jealousy that they might be saved. That's what Romans is all about. Is God done with the Jew? Absolutely not. He's got a great plan, and we're going to see many Jewish people saved. But right now, His grace is on the church, the Gentile church, wanting you to be a slave to this grace, to be a slave to this good news. See, to the, to the world, to the Jew, the cross is a stumbling block. To the unbelieving world, it's foolishness. Because man wants to earn his way to God. And that's the plan of every religion. You work, you do, you obtain, you strive to reach God. To earn your salvation. But you know what, if you hear nothing else, know this, it's impossible. You cannot reach God. You cannot be good enough. You cannot do anything to earn your salvation. No matter what you do, you fall short. So God sent himself to mankind, clothed in flesh, fully God, fully man, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, reaching down to mankind to save mankind from our sinful condition that has separated us from him. To those who say yes to this gospel. And look again at verse 17. For in it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The righteousness of God is revealed to those who believe from faith to faith. Now, a better translation would be from faith to 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 faith. It's a perfect participle. It's a continual act. The NIV actually translates a little bit better. I'm not one to, but it basically says from faith from first to last, from beginning to end, faith. And notice God didn't say from faith to works. Or he didn't say from works to faith. Salvation is appropriated by simple faith, which the Bible says even the very faith to believe is a gift of God. And you might say, I'm not a believer. God hasn't given me the faith. Oh, guess what? i got great news for you. The Bible says that God has given a measure of faith to everyone. Everyone has a measure of faith. And the purpose of the faith given to you is not to believe in yourself to believe in Jesus Christ. That's why he gave you this faith. And the Bible also says that all people who believe will know the righteousness of God. So he concludes this section by quoting Habakkuk 2.4, which says, the just shall live by faith. A more literal reading would read, the justified one shall live by faith. Justified. If Jesus is your savior, you're justified. And that word means as if you've never sinned ever. You're justified, paid, it's done. God does not see your sins. As far as east is from west, so he sees your sins no more. You're justified, you're righteous. You, when God sees, he doesn't say, oh, well, you know, there's that first part of their life all full of sin. No, he sees no sin at all. And that means you need to live by faith. Well, we're going to get into this a little bit more next week because... We could camp here for 400 years just on this verse. But we'll just spend about 15 minutes next week. Let's pray. And you know what? If, if God has spoken to your heart and you feel like you've been trying to earn his love or earn your way into salvation, open up your heart to receive God's unmerited favor, to receive his love, to receive his gospel. You know what, and if you're born again as we pray, you know what, be in a, a, a spirit of prayer for anyone that may not be born again here. Because the worst thing that could ever happen is someone not saved would leave here not saved. Pray for them. Pray for your loved ones. 
But Father, we come before you now in Jesus' name, grateful for your gospel, grateful that you sent a less than man to live a perfect life, to die for our sins, that we might have eternal life, and more than eternal life, that we might have an abundant life based on a relationship with you. Oh, how you love us and how you want to spend time with us. Lord, help us to walk in your grace and in your love, knowing that we don't have to do anything to earn your love. We just have to receive it and walk in it. And Father, if there's anyone here that maybe is a, a little religious or maybe has been trying to earn their way into your favor, right now touch their heart, Lord. Touch their heart because we know that in your gospel is power. And Lord, we desire that all should walk in that love. Bless Lord Jesus, we pray. And we pray this in Jesus' name.